the Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. The Journalism School this week gave eight individuals the Missouri Honor Medal for Distinguished Services in Journalism. Three of the winners are investigative journalists, and they're with us today in the studio of the Reynolds Journalism Institute. John Ferrugia is an investigative journalist and news anchor with KMGH-TV in Denver. Jeff Lean is assistant managing editor at the Washington Post. He's in charge of the newspaper's investigative unit. And Umar Chima is an investigative reporter for a Pakistani newspaper with a straightforward name, The News. Welcome to Global Journalist. Thank you. Now, the, uh, I wanted to first get, talk about some personal anecdotes. When I was uh, um, in, a journalist and uh, I was editor of my high school newspaper, and I uh, I got really uh, uh, jazzed about a story that I did there, and I got interested in going to journalism school because it was about the time that the Watergate scandal was was uh, was developing. What's uh, uh, I guess uh, starting um, uh, with with you, John? What's uh, what's an example of what story that you reported got you really hooked on investigative journalism? Well, I think for for many of my generation, uh, 60 Minutes was uh, mm -hmm. you know the, the weekly tune-in. And I think uh, at that point, when I came to journalism school, uh, I remember the TV Guide had Harry Reasoner and Dan Rather and uh, Mike Wallace on a white horse with lances uh, as being these crusaders. Um, and and I, really, I really looked at 60 Minutes as kind of the, um, the pinnacle of journalism. Um, so that's what really interested me, got me initially interested in, in journalism. Uh, and then at, here at the University of Missouri, when I first... Um, when I first came to the university, uh, the very first story that I was ever involved in uh, at KOMU TV mm -hmm. um, involved um, my going out to a, a HUD project. There was uh, federal money being spent on some houses, some yeah, renovations. Right. And, uh, and at that house, at one of those houses, I found uh, a young woman who, at first, the workman thought was, was actually dead and thought it was a body. It was not. It was, in fact, a woman who I later found out and through investigation found out had been held uh, by her mother and, uh, and her mother's um, uh, boyfriend, and they were in their 70s, for some 20 years uh, captive in this home. And that was the first story I ever did. And uh, it really taught me about uh, the impact uh, a story could have on public policy. Uh, there were lots of questions about their mental health, about, mm -hmm. about adults at risk, uh, and so on. Uh, the young woman was then uh, 34 years old, had not been seen since high school. Um, and, uh, and immediately after the story, of course, she was rescued from that home. Uh, a lot of litigation happened. There was right. a lot of mental health, mental health issues and so on. But that really taught me that there was this power uh, for right. good or for, for interest, public interest and public policy uh, uh, out of these stories. That's quite a story at first out of the shoot. And you, 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 you grew up in Fulton, a little town uh, about 30 miles away yeah, from here, right? Yeah. And, you, and, you, and you came to the to Yes, the, to the university, yeah. Here. Uh, quite an eye-opening start, yeah. And, and Jeff, uh, what would you say your, is your... Well, I was really a child of Watergate, so yeah. my uh, avatars and heroes were Woodward and Bernstein. And I came to... <clears throat> but I really learned and got b bitten by the investigative bug when I came here at the University of Missouri in 1979 to get my master's degree. And uh, while I was at the University of Missouri, I took a break and worked for the Columbia Daily Tribune, and I did two investigative stories that launched me on my career. The first was about a banker in Kirksville, Missouri, who had gotten caught in a check-kiting scam, and the entire town thought he was innocent, and he appealed all the way to the Supreme Court and lost. And I went there thinking I was going to do a story about a banker who was innocent being sent to prison, but I read the court record on the advice of the prosecutor, and which is something I'm sure that m most of the town hadn't done, and I realized he was actually guilty. So I did a story about somebody everybody thought was innocent who, who was actually guilty, and it was based on records that I'd seen, and I saw the power of records and the power of digging. The second story I did at the Columbia Daily Tribune, and this is ironic because I didn't realize this until now, was about what happened to the woman that John was was talking about right. who was held captive in her home for 20 years. I went back and looked at her journey through the mental health system, mm -hmm. and I got uh, her guardian to give me all of her mental health records. And ironically, she had gotten better un under the health system, but her mother, who was, had some mental problems of herself, went to court, regained custody of her. She went back into her mother's care and regressed. Wow. So I was able to 
show kind of what had happened to that long tangled story and the power of digging and public records to, you know, uh, unseat and bring light to injustices and abuses. All right. And Umar, about yourself in Pakistan. Yeah, when I started journalism, I realized that the media is getting very powerful and uh, it is uh, transmitting information very speedily and uh, at a very fast pace. But uh, one thing that was missing, uh, it was not educating the people that if you say that uh, uh, there is a rampant corruption, how it is being done, and uh, how the law is helping the accused. So it this was the portion that was not being taught about. So people were unaware what's happening and how it's happening. So I thought that I should be different and I should do uh, go for investigative reporting. So... Uh, this was a time uh, when the media was on the rise and uh, there was no investigative cluster. So my newspaper uh, formed an investigative cluster and we started doing different stories. And again, when we started doing it, there are some popular subjects that everybody can interfere into it. Everybody wants to write about it because it's easy and they are soft target, relatively tough targets you know that uh, there are no go areas nobody wants to write about them like in tele incidencies right. about the armed forces uh, i decided to try on that side and i did uh, uh, there were different cases unfortunately uh, since 9 11 pakistan has been into the war and terror and at certain places it happens that uh, uh, for example high profile um, uh, officials have been killed but again uh, those uh, accused uh, uh, in their, uh, for their killing, they have been acquitted by the court due to lack of evidence. And there was, you know, that everybody was training guns at the courts that they are quitting the people. So I started investigating that, how it's happening. And I found out that there is a serious lack of coordination between the intelligence agencies between, and the police and the prosecution department. And I wrote about it, about a three-star journal. He was killed. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, even the FIR was not uh, registered by the army, it was done by the police itself. And uh, the intelligence agencies illegally detained the accused for a year. And when they were later hand handed over to the police, uh, no uh, findings were shared with them. So there was no evidence when the case moved to the court. There was uh, 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 no from the army side who would appear as a witness in the standbacks. And finally, the accused were acquitted. So, uh, many such examples. So I did stories and uh, you know that it created ripple and uh, I understand that uh, on policy issues uh, uh, they were taken up very seriously and now uh, you know that a certain amount of coordination has been set up and uh, how to move forward. Things are moving very quickly. Right. And recently I did stories because according to the Pakistani law, uh, a dual national who is the national of Pakistan and in another country, he cannot be a member of the parliament. Still, there are many people and uh, the court had uh, taken action and they said that uh, they should quit. Uh, but many were uh, quietly sitting in the parliament and I discovered some of them and uh, the court took action on my uh, stories and they summoned me and they said that provided us the evidence uh, in support of your story, what you are doing. And then finally, I provided the evidences and on the basis of that evidence, because they were not contested by the accused, the court uh, disqualified those members from the parliament. Right. Now, before uh, we get into the, the, the questions, I wanted to give a little bit more background uh, on each of you for, for our listeners. And of course, we know, we know Umar has uh, continually risked his life for, for, for doing investigative reports in, in Pakistan. And last year, uh, uh, Umar received the International Press Freedom Award. And uh, John is, uh, has quite, produced quite a few television news reports that resulted in new laws and created changes in public policy, government, government and public safety in Colorado. And John has been honored with the industry's most prestigious awards. He's also from, you know, again, from, from a small town near here, so we're, we're, we're proud of him here in, in Missouri. And, uh, and Jeff has worked on uh, seven uh, uh, Washington Post investigations that were honored by Pulitzer Prizes. That's, that's quite a, a large number uh, of, of those the biggest awards in the, in, the, in the field. They included the uh, Hurricane Andrews impact on South Florida ab abuse in a, uh, D.C. group homes and the September 11th uh, plot. And, uh, and 
Jeff also graduated from uh, the, the J School back when back when I was a student uh, here, which uh, makes me feel like an underachiever. But uh, I wanted to ask kind of an overall question first about about the state of investigative journalism now, as the as the uh, uh, media industry is going through uh, a complete overhaul in some ways. And uh, John, can we start with you? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges. Um, for especially in local broadcasts, uh, is dollars. I mean, this is very expensive. It's a very expensive um, proposition to uh, to field a team that is not uh, on the air producing every single day. Right. Although um, uh, we're we're addressing that challenge in Denver and other places, but I, I would say there are probably six or seven real investigative teams at the local level. Um, I- in this country that do this kind of work, uh, you know, on a, on a daily basis. Um, because it's so expensive, many, many general managers simply don't see it as integral. Uh, I mean, there's, there, there's time to fill. Um, and so we, we get a lot more, um, uh, information from what I call here they come, there they go kind of mm-hmm. reporting, and that's not bad. It's just that that is one component of a newsroom, and I think integral to a newsroom is this kind of work. But it's, as I said, it's very expensive, and I think, uh, I think there are very few people who are doing it. I also think that there's, um, there's less and less appetite for it because of the legal issues. Uh, oftentimes, uh, I have to reference, you know, our, our communications lawyer. Right. Um, our station is owned by Scripps. Um, and Scripps is a media company. It's, uh, that's what it does for a living. They love what we do for a living. But, um, but often we're dealing with legal issues, right. and there is always, especially in local stations, that concern about a lawsuit and the cost of a lawsuit and the cost of legal fees. Okay. So people, uh, people are a little reticent. Yeah, often I hadn't to get thought it. about that. You know, people always talk about the, you know, the, the, the bottom line in advertising, but uh, the, that uh, the uh, cost of fighting... Uh, lawsuits is another factor I hadn't well, considered. Well, and one other issue you have is you have a, have a lot of media groups right now that are that are owned by investment folks. So you're talking about some some of these groups are 30, 40 stations that are investment groups. They're really interested in in the bottom line. They're really not interested in the you know in depth reporting. Now they're doing a service, no question, in their communities. But uh, but the in depth reporting is kind of the last thing they're right. going to do because it's expensive. And Jeff, can we give a kind of a national, maybe even an international perspective? Sure. Uh, I would agree with everything John said. The, the work is hard and difficult and risky, but it's always been hard and difficult and risky. The financial pressures have gotten worse over time. Uh, I like to say that the Internet has changed everything, and, and it's the same time the Internet has changed nothing, because the Internet has changed everything about the way we connect with readers, about the way we promote our work, about the way we display and present our work. But the eternal verities of investigative reporting remain. You still need to get the document, you know, the smoking gun document. You still need to get the interview. You still need to develop the source. You still need to build the investigation that penetrates through the uh, public uh, obfuscation and gets to the truth. So all of those things are going on at once where the business model is changing, the way we present our stories are changing, but the way we do our, the the fundamental reporting and gathering of sources and documents is remaining the same. I think that what I'm noticing now is that as we go through changes in the business model, people are starting to double down on investigative reporting. They're starting to realize that in a world of punditry and echoing and copycatting on the, on the web, investigative reporting is real original content that, that you can't get anywhere else. You have to go to that one place. So it's going to get eyeballs. It's going to drive hits. It's going to, in a way, I believe, at some point create a new business model. So I think people are beginning to recognize this and they're beginning to support investigative uh, reporting, not so much out of a public interest, but out of, out of, a, out of a strategy that could work as a business strategy. All right. Uh, Umar, how, how uh, in, in your area of the world, how is the uh, state of investigative journalism c- compared, now compared, say, when, when you first started um, I agree with them, but you know, uh, as I am living in a different world, we have the uh, different challenges. First of all, uh, newspaper in, um, uh, owners they they don't uh, encourage the reportings because they have to put an extra money in it into it. And second, 
sometimes you realize that investigative reporting that blocks advertisement so uh, they are little hesitant doing it and just imagine that uh, among the daily newspapers uh, my newspaper have the investigative reporting cluster yet we don't have a proper infrastructure uh, we are just a bunch of people we don't have a supporting staff like uh, for uh, computer assisted reporting or other side things to uh, keep our data uh, extra uh, and second uh, and you know that due to this reason uh, we are going to set up a center and why we are going to set up a center for investigative reporting i realized this i was doing stories about uh, the taxes of the uh, politicians and i did in uh, 2000 and 10 and uh, i made extra efforts to collect the details but when it was finally done my newspaper was not ready to publish them because they have their own tax problems so now uh, i'm trying it again and uh, 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 we have uh, completed the exercise for their taxes of 2011 and now we are going to start uh, we are going to publish uh, inaugurate the report and center simultaneously and uh, we'll distribute uh, such work and even in the future among all the media houses and uh, uh, foreign and local level so that uh, an awareness should be created and uh, the newspaper industry should be pressurized into setting mm -hmm. up such centers in Pakistan. Right. Now, before we continue our discussion, I want to remind everyone that you can view or listen to this program anytime by downloading our video podcasts at globaljournalist.org. You can also find interesting articles, photos, and interviews related to today's program on our website. So please send us questions or comments via globaljournalist at kbi.org or our Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at our new handle at globaljourn, global, J-O-U-R-N. I wanted to um, get back to the impact of social media on, on investigative journalism. Um, and we'll kind of change up the order, Jeff. I'll, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, have you, you and your crews, uh, has it been easier to, I guess, let's talk about the good and bad. Has it been easier to find sources, to crowdsource, uh, to get uh, uh, data? Uh, and then um, are there also complications because of the, uh, uh, the rise of social media for well, investigative journalism? I mean, the Washington Post now has an entire department devoted to social media. And, and to making those connections and to managing that reader engagement. And we put a lot of effort into strategies for connecting with, with our audience and think a lot about our audience. And, but I would say as, as an actual investigative re reporting tool, uh, social media is a little different. I mean, it's a way to quickly find names and track people down when you're working on a breaking story and you want to get some information. It, you know, for the, for the heavy-duty, hardcore digging of, of important truths, you, you still have to build it piece by piece with, with records, documents, and sources. And the internet can be a way to point you to a record document or source, but then, then the investigative skill comes in on obtaining it. And the, the, the connecting of the dots, the linking, is still uh, the old school uh, in, in, internal investigative verities. But, but we have tried many techniques, and we're experimenting all the time, and we're looking for new things to drive reporting. One of the things we do now is a lot of database reporting. Mm -hmm. And we'll put our databases online and we encourage our readers to look at it and tell us what they see. But, uh, but you know, the readers aren't crowdsourcing and giving us the best stories. I mean, you, the return on that is still a little bit low and disappointing. But, but we still, you know, people email us good tips. You know, we st we're always looking for good tips. We're always trying new things. We're, we're throwing the web out there. I think that where it's really changed is in presentation. Uh, as, a, as, we, as a print newspaper, it used to be, you know, we, you know, it appeared in the paper. It was on your doorstep, and, you know, you wrapped fish in it, and that was the end of it you re after you read it, hopefully. Nowadays, you, we can virtually do our own documentaries on the web with audio, video, uh, interactive graphics, interactive databases, which opens a whole new world for our investigations. I mean, you know, when we were investigating the Chandra Levy homicide, we had a decision to make. Do we tell this as a traditional newspaper story, or do we turn this into a documentary? And it was a really interesting challenge to have to face. But, but these are exciting new challenges, and we're always looking for new tools. We're always looking for the thing that will provide the breakthrough. But the shoe leather reporting is still at the basis of what we do. Okay. And Umar, at the news, uh, how was uh, the 
social media helped and, and maybe even hindered uh, what you're doing with investigative work? Um, you know that, uh, uh, personally speaking, it helps a lot because uh, uh, on Twitter and uh, on Facebook, uh, uh, people just uh, keep sending me the tips that uh, you can do it this way, you can do it that way. Uh, we happen to be a traditional society and uh, sometimes people uh, either have uh, a direct link and easy link with the journalist or they don't have any link. Right. So, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, often uh, we are just... Uh, informed on the telephone that uh, something is going to happen there, you can please check it. So uh, this is one source of uh, getting information and the other source uh, is social media. Uh, on the newspaper level, there is no uh, such organized effort uh, to utilize the social media for uh, information gathering and uh, channelizing it and uh, putting the reporters on those assignments. Right, and, and if you had any problem with uh, uh Misinformation, rumors going get going wild yeah, because of social lot. media. They are they are in plenty, you know. Yeah, uh, it's very uh, it's very easy. Most of the things, you know, that uh, Pakistan media is uh, enjoying a fair amount of freedom, uh, but simultaneously there is a problem that uh, a lot of speculative stuff uh, keeps coming in, and you know that uh, in such a situation when uh, everybody is confused and everybody is frustrated. Uh, they uh, they just uh, greet such speculations and especially those uh, that is of uh, their taste and that they just uh, keep imagining in their thoughts that this can happen and if somebody speculates about they say that it's quite likely that's going to happen <laughs> yeah yeah and, and John I, I think the, uh, what Jeff was saying is, is very important because um, you still have to do the, you know the, right. <laughs> the shoe leather the gum chewing but the thing that really uh, that really helps us a, a lot is that when you're on the web on that platform uh, your stories are then looked at and viewed by people all over the country and it's it's much easier to connect with people when you can point to uh, we're doing this hey can you can you, are you online right now take a look at this this is what we're doing can you talk to us about it whether it even to the point where it's a lawyer who's involved in a in a uh, in a case or, or right. whatever but we do a lot of database work that's where we do most of our work we're we're looking at I mean what separates what I do for a living than someone in, in the newsroom is I'm not looking at a specific incident to get on the air that night I'm looking at an incident and I'm looking at that incident or I'm looking at that situation as almost a porthole through which to view a horizon and to say is there a database is this one example of of, of an issue, or are there many examples out there? What does this represent in the broader picture? And the web obviously helps with that, but also um, when we're looking for people. I mean, social media, we can connect with any, really, uh, just people we couldn't connect with before. And when you're talking with someone on the phone, let's say in another state, or a victim, let's say, in another state, you call them, you say, this is who I'm, by the way, are you on the are you on the web right, right now? Right. Yes, I am. Okay, well, look this. Look up our website. This is who I am. I mean, literally on the phone. Okay, this is who I am. Click it. You know. Okay, that's that's who you're talking to. This is what I do for a living. And and so there's a there's a comfort level often. Uh, or or yeah, I've seen your stuff on the web. Or I get you on Twitter. I know who you are. Um, and I think that that social media connection has helped me. I know and helped our our unit in in in, in many stores. Right, and one of the one of the things that uh, um, let's change, change get, get personal again. One of the things that uh, seems to characterize each of you is courage. And uh, John, your your reports on um, um, sexual assaults of female cats at cadets at the Air Force Academy and the uh, uh, deaths at the uh, uh, Pueblo, Colorado State Mental Institute. You know, the tough, hard hitting, difficult stories to to put together. And uh, and Jeff, when you you worked uh, investigating the Medellin drug cartel uh, and when you worked in, in Miami that must have been uh, difficult and in, in Umar you, you were kind of in a class in your own uh, you know the stuff that you did you know and you've, you've been um, beaten run over by a car tortured um, abducted uh, all because of your writing on on sensitive issues in, in Pakistan let me ask each of you and um, I'll start with you, you Omar where do you where do you derive your inner strength? How, you know, what, what drives you to risk your life? What drives you to, to do these courageous acts? Um, um, do you have a, a mentor or a hero or 
just something that you, you where you go to derive your inner strength? Uh, I just try to put myself into the shoes of great people that I don't know who they are. <laughs> Actually, there are many people. So uh, when I say great people, because uh, I don't have any particular example, but I try to gather uh, good things from everybody. Right. So you know that uh, when I was abducted, tortured, and when they dumped me and I was headed home, and I asked myself that, you know, that uh, you have been put on a test. And uh, this is the test of your courage. Uh, this is the test of your nerves that uh, how long you can stand on. So you have to be aware of this fact that uh, you are under examination and uh, you have to be a successful candidate. So uh, I went ahead with this in mind. And second, you know that uh, uh, I went through post-traumatic stress and uh, almost for uh, an hour. In our country, there is no concept of going to psychiatrist. Uh, if somebody does, uh, mostly people in the rich class, they do. Uh, we generally uh, consider it as a shortcoming that everybody has some problems and I'm, I'm why I'm going to. So I was, uh, I was my uh, own, you know, that... Uh, uh, practitioner, I, I was my own healer. I was uh, just treating myself on my own, uh, doing my psychotherapy that, you know, things are moving this way, that way. So uh, I remained under uh, very much stress. And most of the time I realized that uh, who knows that I may be killed someday because I was chased a number of times after the incident. Uh, <clears throat> one day I was headed home and uh, I asked this question that what's going to happen with me? Then I asked, and then I told myself, you know, that uh, I don't have any vested interest. I don't have any personal agenda. So if the worst case scenario is that I'm killed. So if I'm killed, it means that I'll be killed while fighting for the truth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that uh, it's not such a big price. Uh, at least I, this is something, this power of truth that gives me the courage that uh, uh, kept me standing on. So this is okay. how I did it. That's incredible. We have about a, a minute left. If you could, uh, uh, Jeff, you could give us your thoughts on. Well, I think all of us uh, investigative reporters have to consider the risk of what we do, and and we could, uh, in the United States, the risk is very different than it is for for. Uh, foreign reporters where it's much greater. And we can all take courage from the example of foreign uh, uh, investigative reporters, which which I do and have done. When we were looking at the Medellin cartel, uh, I realized that they killed investigative reporters who wrote in Spanish, but not in English. So we formed an alliance with the Spanish investigative reporters, got much of the information that they would have been killed for, and were able to print it in English. And then they reprinted it in Spanish under our banner. So okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to... That is a quick brief. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think answer. I think what happens w with with all of us is is that we often see ourselves as saying we're the ones who can do this story. We have to do this story. We have the talent to do this story. So it's the right thing to do. Well, you guys have done some inc incredible uh, in stor stories, and and uh, you're obviously you're being honored uh, tonight to, because of that work. But we've come to the end of this week's edition of Global Journalists, produced by the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalists. Journalism joining us today were Umar Chima from the News in Pakistan, Jeff Lean from the Washington Post, and D John Ferruja from KMGH TV in Colorado. Global Journalist is directed by Travis McMillan, audio by Pat Akers, Raymond Tungakar is our ex executive producer, Sarvani Perra was our lead producer. Join us again next week for another Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. Mm -hmm.